guys and welcome back to Mo Inc. If you guys are new here, then what is up? My name is Erica. Hey, how you doing? Now, I'm not going to do a whole long introduction today because I know that you guys clicked on this video because I have an interview. Today, I am talking to the incredible Nina McLaughlin who wrote Wake Siren, which is my new obsession. It is a retelling of Ovid's Metamorphoses from the women's point of view in all of these different myths in a modern voice. And I just think it's absolutely beautiful and stunning. And I don't know why more people online are not screaming about this. So don't worry, I'll do it. Nina and I spoke about absolutely everything today. We get into Ovid himself, we get into poetry, we get into the style of writing, we get into the importance of writing female stories and focusing on female stories from mythology like Ovid's. These really dark stories that are often not told and often not focused on uh, in sort of, you know, pop culture. Ones that we don't really want to tell, myths that we don't want to touch. Nina McLaughlin did all of that in her book and so today we really dive in deep to figure out why she wanted to do that, to discuss why it's important to do that as well um, in a modern voice and for a modern audience and hopefully you guys will get re-engaged with this book, you guys will get re-engaged with Ovid. Yeah, I'm so excited and honestly this interview was such a dream for me. I emailed Nina way before I'd even finished the book and was just like, I'm completely obsessed, please talk to me and she was so kind, so patient, so wonderful. Without further ado, it gives me such, such a great pleasure. Uh, to roll this interview for you guys. So let's just get into it. So welcome to Monique, Nina. Thank you so much for sitting down and chatting to me because you are the only author that I have actually emailed before I started, before I even finished even reading your book. So I hadn't even started to think of an interview, but like halfway through I was like, wait, this is so good. So thank you for replying and just being like, you know what, you haven't finished, but sure, I'll come and chat to you. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely my pleasure, I'm delighted. I'm delighted to be here. But I thought that we would start the interview by just handing the ball right over to you and letting you introduce yourself and your background, your education, or whatever it is that you think a newbie who hasn't heard of you before should know. Sure, um, so my name is Nina McLaughlin. I studied English and classical studies in college. Um, when I graduated, I got a job at a newspaper and so worked in journalism for most of my 20s. Um, and then left my journalism job in sort of an abrupt way and got a job as a carpenter, um, which I did for about nine years. Um, and so while I was doing the carpentry job, I was also writing. I wrote a book about leaving journalism and learning the carpentry trade. I was also doing a bunch of freelance work. Um, when I stopped the carpentry work, uh, I was sort of trying to get my writing muscles back in shape um, and sort of sat down with Ovid one morning. Uh, I was reading over it just to sort of, you know, get the juices flowing and, and decided to try rewriting one of the stories from the female perspective um, and sort of felt like, oh, wow, that that felt good. Uh, and then did another and another. And that's how Wake Siren came about very quickly. Um, and then I have a third book um, called Summer Solstice, which is a short book length essay uh, about the summer. Um, and so right now, sort of a sort of more of a writing life. Um, I write a column for a newspaper called the Boston Globe about um, regional literary news um, and, and live in Cambridge, Massachusetts. So did you study classics then only at university or were you open to it beforehand? Like did your school, cause I don't know how the American schooling system works. Did you have access to it before or was it something that you came to later? Yeah, that's a good question. In, um, in high school, I had taken Latin uh, all through high school and um, my advisor in high school was a sort of Latin teacher, Greek and Roman civ teacher and I loved her. Um, and it just felt like to study classics was to study everything in my mind. It was sort of a way to, to literature, history, drama. Um, it just sort of felt like oh, the widest array of stuff you could get. Um, and so it was sort of, you know, seated in, in high school and then followed through in college. And I mean, you know, as a kid, I love the myths too. I don't know, I mean, the, I feel like the sort of touchstone book is that Dallaire's book of mythology, that gold, that giant, golden spined book that I feel like a lot of kids, that's sort of their introduction. And I definitely had that in my life. Um, so the stories have sort of been with me uh, the whole time. So they must've been they're familiar with to go back to in Ovid, but they're much darker in Ovid. Was that a bit of a shock when you first started reading Ovid to get that version of them? It's so funny, you know, I in all of my classics education, I never read Ovid in school. And it was when I was working on my first book, Hammerhead, which is about, it's about carpentry and about sort of like what it is to change your life. And as I was writing, I was like, oh, I'm, I need something 
that's not, I need something that's not going to be sort of too influential of what I'm, what I'm working on. I don't want prose. I don't want nonfiction. Oh, great. Like a 12,000 line epic poem. Perfect. I'll just dip into this. Um, and it ended up being sort of the backbone of Hammerhead as well. It was just like, oh, this, this idea of transformation, this idea of change. Um, and so after that, it would just be this text that I would just keep dropping into sort of, I think it's sort of, mm, the beauty of it, the sensuality of it, there's darkness, um, the adventure. I mean, it does feel like every time I enter it, it offers something new. Um, so that's, I mean, that, that, I don't know. I mean, I guess it, I didn't expect it to sort of be as uh, a big a part of my life as it did that, you know, when I started reading it, you know, five or six years ago. I completely agree with that though, with Ovid, that especially when you read different stories in Ovid, like they all offer something incredibly different that I feel, I mean, I'm only 26, but I feel like every time I go back to it, a different story will speak to me at that age. So, which is what I loved about your retelling though as well, that I think each one had its own unique voice that in that same way, you can go back to your book and it's like, well, that little story of the woman though, as you said, it's told from the female perspective, will speak to me hopefully at a different age. I hope in the future, I can't speak for that, but you know, cause you tackle so many different voices as well, just like Ovid did. Totally, I mean, that was the thing. It was, it was interesting because I mean, as you know, the, the stories sort of do, a lot of them sound the same, you know, it's sort of a, a nymph is chased by a god. She's either protected or punished, um, you know, raped or attacked. Uh, and so, in reading it closely, it was sort of looking for those tiny little telling details that differentiated and letting those details sort of speak, you know, to whatever sort of unconscious parts and sort of letting that sort of uh, bring the voice of the woman up, um, which was a really exciting process. I would sort of go for these long runs and just kind of listen, um, which sounds so strange, but it was, I mean, that's what it was. It was sort of hearing these details and just imagining, listening, listening, um, as these voices kind of arose one after the next. I did actually want to ask about the voices because they are so distinct, but I found they were also relatable, as we were saying, like in their own ways. And so I was wondering if you came at it from, cause it's, it's told in a modern voice, like the whole book is very modern. So did you come at it from a modern perspective in regards to like, here are some modern issues I want to talk about. And so then you found ancient counterparts or was it the opposite way that in reading Ovid, you were like, oh, actually, I really like this. Let me find the modern character to tell that story. Yeah, you know, um, gosh, I think probably more so the latter. Um, you know, it was sort of, I think, or maybe sort of a blending in the sense that, you know, these these stories that he's telling are still so human and alive right now. You know, there, there's, there isn't sort of, they're all still resonating, I think. Um, and I also think, I mean, I think one of the things I think so much is that these stories live inside of us, whether we know them sort of explicitly or not. Um, so that you'll come along and you'll, you'll, you'll read through maybe one of the lesser known myths, um, not recognizing the names, but sort of know like, oh, this is familiar. I didn't know that I knew this. Um, so I, you know, it wasn't so much a conscious or deliberate choice to sort of say like, all right, I'm gonna take this sort of modern voice. For me, some of them, yes, are very explicitly modern. Some of them do feel in my own sort of sense of it, um, sort of more uh, located in an ancient register, um, sort of, or like a, a, a timelessness maybe. Um, and that was, I mean, each one, as I said, it was sort of this act of listening to each voice. Um, and some of them, you know, sounded in my mind, like the way you and I would talk. Um, some of them sort of sounded like they came from, you know, a sort of Mount Olympian kind of, uh, sort of more ancient, uh, ancient realm. Well, one of them actually, that was kind of what I feel anyways, it might not have been intentionally done this way, but I felt it was more ancient was actually Echo's retelling. But I loved Echo's retelling, mainly because you told it from Juno's point of view, which I thought was a really interesting point of view to take, to take on the voice of the woman who punished the protagonist of the story and have her say what happened and why it happened. So why did you decide that Juno was gonna tell that story in that voice? Yeah, that's that's a great question. So, you know, it's funny, I think when I was originally thinking about it, Juno, I mean, Juno's such a jerk, you know? I mean, she's <laughs> really awful. 
and I think when I started writing it and thinking about it, I I I think I I, I was envisioning her as sort of you know a villain in some ways, you know, it's sort of a I don't want to say a traitor to women, but not necessarily this kind of paragon of 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 you know female benevolence, obviously. So, um, but as I was thinking about it. I started to get a little bit more sympathetic, you know, that there was, wow, sh her, her life uh, is complicated. And, and how, how would someone who can't sort of, um, you know, <laughs> kill her husband, leave her husband sort of tied in this eternal way, uh, deal with this sort of anger and betrayal. Um, and that there was something, you know, again, human flawed uh, and deeply sad about her situation. And so I think, finding that well of sympathy and kind of tapping into that um, as opposed to sort of my my sort of gut reaction of like, ugh, jerk, you know? I think a lot of us have that gut reaction to Juno though. And like, I'm rereading the Aeneid right now. So one of my series on the channel is just to like tell the Aeneid to a new audience. But I find that like when I wasn't reading, there was a long chunk where I hadn't gone back and read it since university when I read it in Latin to now. And in that period, you're like, God, all she's doing is following him around and making his life miserable. But the book does highlight constantly like her struggles and her history and why she doesn't like him and why she doesn't like the Trojans. And unfortunately, you really can't help but sit there and go, well, yeah, like, no, I kind of get it. Totally. Right. Yeah. There's, there's, there, it's complicated. It's nuanced. You know I mean? It's, it is, it's easy to have those, those strong initial reactions and then thinking about it a little further and a little further. I mean, it, yeah, there, both, both parts exist. Now shifting gears a little bit, I did want to talk to you about uh, your Medusa retelling because, and I don't want this to come off the wrong way to my viewers because obviously Medusa is such an important story. It's a very modern story as well. And a lot of people can relate to Medusa's story of the, you know, this woman being punished for something that wasn't her fault, obviously. But I am slightly sick to death of Medusa's story because <laughs> it is being told all the time. And so you retold Medusa very simply where you just said, we all know the story, here it is. And instead you focused on other really tough stories where women are still sort of put in the same position as Medusa. So you have that one and then contrasted with like Procne and Philomela was a beautiful example, I thought, of people being blamed, women being blamed, and then taking power into their own hands. So how did you tackle more so the more popular stories that everybody else is doing and then shift gears and like, how did you decide where to do that and, and with who to do that in your book? Yeah, good question. Um, you know, in some ways, I mean, gosh, with, with some of the more, I guess, popular sort of well-known uh, stories in some ways a little bit trickier because it is you're sort of dealing with not just the story itself but but you know thousands of years of reinterpretations um, so uh, again I mean it really was this sort of organic just listening what is what does she want to say what does Medusa actually what like what does she want to tell people and some of the way I think of these are 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 in some ways they they, they sort of register me as, as monologues you know sort of just like a woman standing there just speaking what she wants to sort of express after being sort of silenced or not having had a voice for so long. Um, uh, and sort of trying to distill what is the sort of most basic part of this, you know, pulling back the layers as much as, for at least for, for in my own reading interpretation, pulling back the layers and sort of saying, what's at the, what's at the heated molten core of this? Um, you mentioned Procne and Philomela. That that's sort of the centerpiece of the book. It it, it it sort of lands in the actual physical center of the book. It's the longest one. Um, it was by far for me the the sort of most exhausting one to to do. Um, I think it's one of the one of the most or the most sort of brutal in the Ovid itself. Um, uh, and that one, you know, I sort of finished, and it was sort of this absolute depletion. Um, afterwards just because it is it's so violent and it's so horrific um and after that comes Baucus um which I hope I never know if I'm pronouncing that name correctly is that I say that so I don't know <laughs> perfect perfect um which is it which is a much gentler story you know it's a sort of beautiful lasting love story as almost um both for my own mind and psyche and soul um and for the readers this like this reprieve from the brutality you know that it isn't just 
rape and torture and sort of being turned into birds and rocks and streams, um, there are moments of opportunities for real love and real connection, both mortal and immortal. Yeah, Procne and Philomela's story, I feel like, is one that people are now starting to hear about. So I went to a, a play a couple of months ago, not a couple of months ago, it's now July, so it was last August, that's ages ago. But, um, so I went and they redid Ovid's Metamorphoses in uh, like next to the Globe, there's a smaller theater. And they retold Procne and Philomela as well, but the way they did it was like, they had one actor just stand in the middle of the stage and eat an apple, but tell the story as she was eating the apple. And it was like one of the darkest things I've ever watched because it was just one person. Yeah, yep, yep. And I was like, oh my goodness. I don't know if I should be sitting here listening to this. It feels oddly deep. It's so intense. I mean, that story, I mean, it, it is, it's just sort of, I mean, when I was writing this book, it's it it's a writing experience that I have not had and I hope to have it again in my life. Uh, I, I bet that I won't, but I, you know, fingers crossed that it was almost like, sort of feeling like I, I exited and it was just this kind of outpouring. Um, uh, and so it, I wrote the book very quickly, you know, it was it, three months and it was just pff, done. Um, uh, and I think part of that is, is that goes back to that experience of, of these stories sort of being inside of us. Um, uh, whether you're sort of enmeshed in, in the world of mythology or not, whether you sort of are connected to classics. Um, I think all of these ancient, ancient stories across cultures. Um, and so it was this kind of here it comes, here it comes almost like this trance state. Um, and some of it was so, so dark. And I think, you know, in some ways it, you have to sort of leave yourself, like what you were saying this question of like, wow, should I even be hearing this? It's too much to know in some ways. Yeah, and very personal as well in that way. I find that all the myths are very personal. And one of them that you retold, which was my favorite, which I don't know what that says about me, but my favorite retelling was um, Mirrors. I thought you handled that so well. Like, so Mirrors is a really dark story. Um, if you want to tell us a little bit about it, you can, but I'm not going to because it's a little uncomfortable. Um, but the way that you handled Mira, for people who don't know, she's Adonis's mother. And we know who Adonis is in modern day. Everyone seems to know Adonis, but no one knows this horrible story that happened to his mother in order for Adonis to literally exist. So you told it more so in a therapist patient kind of way. So Mira was sort of, I don't wanna say unloading, she was telling the story though to somebody who understood. And I was wondering what made you one, tackle Mira's story because that's dark, but also two, do it in that very palatable and digestible way. Sure. Um, and so what the thing I think is that you're not saying is that, you know, Mira, um, uh, falls, I mean, desires her father, seduces her father, uh, is sexually attracted to her dad, um, and tricks him, sort of sneaks into his bed at night uh, and sleeps with him over and over again. Um, so it's, I mean, that's, it's, it's pretty gross and it's pretty dark. Um, so I think, you know, I guess two things is, you know, it's partly, you know, what would be a situation that someone would be able to tell the story? I mean, it's even uncomfortable, you know, for, for you to say, for me to say. Um, so the, the, the sort of therapy room is one place where it's like, okay, where can you take that sort of the darkest material, the sort of like the really kind of sick, strange stuff that lives in you and, and, and articulate it. You know, it might not be something that you could rap about with your friends. It's not something you could, I mean, even your closest pals. Um, so it's like, that's, that's a space in which there's uh, not necessarily a comfort for her either, but a space where it can be allowed to come out. Um, you know, and it was trying to think of, ah, uh, gosh, like, you know, I think in trying to write that, you know, it's like, it's tricky. Obviously, you don't want to think too hard about it. I think, you know, it's like, okay, I know what it is to desire, you know, so how do I sort of overlay that onto this situation, you know? Um, uh, and I think that having, it's interesting you say that the therapist understood. I don't, I don't know if that's true. I mean, it's, it's, it's one of those things where it's, it's not that I pictured it being a, a he, I don't know if I mentioned that in the story. Um, I pictured the, a male therapist, um, 
ah, that she's speaking to. So I don't know, you know, I don't know if he understands, but there, regardless, that seems almost an irrelevance. It's more so the space to be able to speak it. Um, and like, presumably it's sort of non-judgmental space. Uh, but yeah, I mean, again, exactly as you said, we all know Adonis and that, that Adonis arises out of this, you know, totally incestuous relationship. I think I wasn't really aware of that before I kind of I dug in. Well, I only read that one. I think I read that myth maybe the second or third time I read Ovid. Like, because in school, at least here, we're told to read select books out of Ovid. Um, so, you know, you kind of can pick and choose which ones that you read and the teachers will pick and choose which ones you read. So the first time I read Philemon and Balkis, the first time I read Ovid, I was like, this is a great book. This is wonderful. <laughs> and then by the last time I'm reading Mirror and I'm going, holy crap, no wonder we didn't read this when I first oh, started. It. Totally. But I like that they were all in there. I like that all of these women got a voice in your book and they're women that people won't know and maybe are going to be very uncomfortable meeting, like Mira, for example, but it's bringing them to a new audience. Were you very aware that it was going to be a new audience or were you writing more so for nerds like me to dip into or? That's a cool question. You know, I mean, I think when I was actually writing it, I don't, I sort of don't think about readers. I don't think about anyone actually seeing it. And I don't know if that's sort of superstitious to sort of where, whether it feels sort of presumptuous to think like, oh, who are, you know, who will be these readers? Um, it's sort of this kind of driving force uh, coming out of myself. And it's not until later sort of editing, revising, then it's sort of thinking more about the readers. Um, and, you know, I mean, I guess my hope was that, that it was, you know, would land the people who are sort of do who are sort of saturated in these stories um like you and your sort of listeners and watchers um and that it would also speak to people who don't necessarily know the mythology um that there would be something that would appeal to people even if you don't sort of know the ins and outs of these stories um you know there's a few little little i don't know i think of, i mean gosh like private jokes that if you do know the stories really well that you'll sort of think, oh yeah, like a wink, you know, to someone who who knows it. Um, uh, and there's some sort of crossover between some of the stories are, are a little bit in conversation, which if you don't notice, I hope, you know, it doesn't lack for it. And if you do, it's just that kind of added, added layer um, of, you know, insight or pleasure or whatever that. I was wondering actually, as you were talking, was there any woman that you found really difficult to tell, like not difficult, like subject matter, but I mean like headwise, you just couldn't hack it. You just couldn't crack it. And it took a really long time to get into that, that myth. Yeah, you know, as I was moving through the metamorphoses that, you know, some of the, as I said earlier, some of the stories, I mean, they, they are similar. And so there are some women that are not included. I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot that I didn't write. In part, it, you know, if the stories were just too similar and if they were sort of, you know, it was like, oh, this one, I already have one that is so based around jealousy or, you know, a theme that I'd already covered. Um, and like, you know, the voices wouldn't kind of speak to me as loud as some of the others. Um, I'm trying to think, you know, you mentioned Echo, the Echo story. I think when I first wrote that, I wrote it from Echo's perspective in a way that felt expected and predictable. And it was, it was just like, God, this is, this is not it. This is not landing. I know that there's a better way to get across this story. Um, trying to think, I think Thetis was another one um, who I, I had, I think done a version of, and then had that kind of, one of those beautiful lightning bolt moments of sort of saying, again, this is too flat. Like, <clears throat> excuse me, like what, what's another way to tell this? And that one actually ended up being probably my favorite one to write. That was sort of the, the it's a, one of the most experimental ones. Um, uh, Thetis changes into, <clears throat> you know, a hundred, hundred different, different creatures um, and sort of moving through this sort of shape shifting that goes on. And that was just a pleasure to write. Um, but again, that one was one that I had to sort of think through a couple times. And with these characters, so Thetis is a great example. Um, they do pop up in other mythology, right? So like Thetis very famously comes up in like the Iliad and and lots of other characters. Procne and Philomela thankfully don't pop up anywhere else, but like a lot of them do. So did you also find that you were dipping into those stories maybe to help you or was it just completely Ovid focused? It was completely Ovid focused and I was really deliberate. You know, I mean, there's so many both in other texts, other original texts, and so many reinterpretations, it would be so tempting to sort of, oh, how did someone else handle this? And I, and I didn't, I really wanted to be sort of just, just Ovid at me, you know? I mean, it was really just this book um, 
and what I was working on. Uh, so I did, I did just stick with that. I mean, I could tell that you did. I was just really curious because as soon as I opened the book, like I bought it because it came up as an Amazon recommended, which I never usually buy those books because they're usually something that has nothing to do with what I like or it's something really random. But because it said Ovid resung, I was like, resung? I'm curious. Okay, let's buy this. But it was so apparent from like the first page that it was, at least the way that I read it, it was it was almost as if you had Ovid next to you and you were not copy and pasting, but definitely taking, okay, the sentiments of these three lines, writing those in my first two lines and, and so on and so forth. I was just curious if you had dragged it from anywhere else because it was so, like, so similar. I was really shocked. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, no, yeah, I, I, you sensed right. I mean, it really was just sort of sitting there with the text and really, again, just these distillations, you know, sort of just sort of saying, you know, this is, this is how I hear the story. Um, this is what it is on the page. Here's, you know, how it's turning around inside me and then kind of digesting it out, I guess. Now, Ovid is poetry. So another one of my questions was that because your book really did come off as, and maybe again, I'm just looking for it because I'm a nerd, but it came off as very poetic and very lyrical, but it is written in prose. Um, so, you know, you do read it like a normal book, but it came off as very tempo-like, like of its poetry. Was that an intentional structure that you took on or was it more so that a happy coincidence as you were writing, it just kind of came out and you were like, great. Yeah, you know, that's, I, I am I am a sucker for a well-cadenced sentence. I do, I do um, love, the rhythm of sentences um and maybe it comes from reading you know the it, the iliad and the odyssey as a young age it's kind of got imprinted the, those rhythms um but i mean that's it wasn't it definitely wasn't a choice to sort of say uh all right i'm gonna i'm gonna write in this lyric way i think it's just like this, this is this is sort of how i it's it's almost like not a choice i mean this is this is the way i don't know that i was writing for this project you know and this sort of this is sort of the natural Ah, I don't know, voices that come up. I'm trying to think. I mean, with journalism, it's much different. You know, I mean, I write in a much, you know, it's, it isn't quite as <sighs> lyrical, poetic, uh, voicey, sensual. Obviously, I'm just trying to get facts across. Um, but, you know, the, the cadence and the rhythm, um, that I try to bring to sentences all the time. Because that's, I'm a sucker for that in other people's writing. No, that's so fair. I just didn't know because, Sometimes I always look at things and I go, oh, I see things. And then I'll talk to authors and they'll be like, no, but I'm glad it worked that way. So, <laughs> so I always want to double check. So I'm like, am I just constantly looking for mythology? Or am I just constantly looking for, for ancient things and everything? Because that is literally my job now. And I think, I mean, that's, that's what's so cool. It's that, you know, it might not have been a conscious intent on my part, but if, you know, if you or a reader is sort of, if, if you're seeing it, it could, it could be there, you know, like it could be there without me knowing it's there. Uh, and it, just because it isn't deliberate doesn't mean that it, it doesn't exist in some sort of, I don't know, unconscious way. Um, yeah, so I mean, that's always really thrilling to sort of hear like, oh, I see this. And it was like, wow, I had I had no idea. And that's, yeah, that's incredible. So for our non-mythology, maybe like proper nerds watching, or if there are some mythology nerds watching, um, it depends, I really get, a cross between both of them on this channel, which is great and I love that. But for all those people, was there somebody necessarily that you were writing that you felt this story needs to be heard more that you maybe would think that people, or you think that people should go and read maybe from the Ovid or read in particular from your book first and foremost, just a woman that really spoke to you from a modern voice? Wow. Wow. Um, you know, I mean, I guess what I would say to that in some ways is that I think it's the, the sort of collective force of these voices, that the, the, the sort of entire chorus of them, um, that there are, again, the stories can be similar, but the fact that there are all these different experiences, all these different voices coming together with very different sounds, um, very different stories, very different reactions to what's happened to them, and some similar. Um, I think it's the kind of the the total upswell of voice rather than one in particular. Um, and that there's a lot of different ways to sort of move through a life, a, 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 an experience, good or bad. Um, and that, 
you know, that, that these stories can sort of show a reader that, you know, this huge variety um, and just the importance, not of one voice, but of many voices telling. Did, was there one that you felt was like, oh, this is the crucial touchstone? Oh, I don't know. I think because, I think I like to ask authors that question though, and people who reinterpret because I get so bogged down in the mythology that I do, I, I get bogged down in these details that other people don't care about, which I'm completely aware of. And that's my flaw as a classicist, that I look for the beauty in every single story, or like the detail where I'm like, this person's important for this. Or if somebody's not retold, then I really want a gun for that character. And then maybe they'll get retold too many times. And then I'm like, okay, now I'm over that character. So I definitely lack that ability to have, to like step back from it. But as I said before, I mean, Mirrors was my favorite one just because I have never seen anyone touch it before because I don't think that people know how to, I wouldn't know how to. So I think that one was my favorite, but I also really loved Callisto as well. I thought that one was really beautiful as well. Callisto, yeah, thank you. That's so nice. Callisto was the first one I did. And that was, I mean, that was, as I said, I was just sort of sitting there almost just as an exercise for myself. Um, and this, the first two lines, you know, I am a bear, I live in the sky. Almost immediately, it was just like, you know, this kind of electric feeling of like, all right, here we go. Um, so that's, I'm, I'm glad that that one sort of landed for you because that was, that, that did sort of feel like the start of the whole project for me. So thank you so much for joining us today on, on the channel. It means a lot to me because again, I hadn't even finished your book when I emailed you. So thank you so much for taking a chance on this channel. And for everybody who's watching, if you guys want to buy the book, if we convinced you, everything is in the description below. So you guys can go and check that out down there. We have links to the book on every single website that I could find. So it should be easy for anybody in any country. But thank you again, Nina, so much for chatting to me today. It was such a pleasure. I'm so delighted to have been here. I really appreciate your time. So thank you guys so much for watching and we'll be seeing you next time with more videos here on Morning. We'll see you then.